Sir John Herschel, in a lecture before the Royal Society of London in 1839, made the word photography known to the world. The word derives from the Greek words photos and graph, meaning together, drawing with light. The photographer Edward Weston said, Look at the things around you. If you're alive, it will mean something to you. And if you know how to use photography, you will want to photograph that meaning. The earliest type of camera is known as a camera obscura, Italian for dark room. A camera obscura is a darkened room which allows light to enter through a small opening projecting a picture onto the screen. In a modern version, the view outside is reflected by a mirror through a lens which projects it onto a viewing table. Looking down at the table, one sees a living two-dimensional image of the outside scene in full color. The principles of the camera obscura were known since the 5th and 4th century BCE by the Chinese and Greeks respectively. Although images formed by pinholes were known to the ancients, the discovery of lenses in the 15th century made it possible to obtain a bright and clear picture. In 1500, Leonardo da Vinci wrote, Here are the figures, here are the colors, here are all the images of every part of the universe are contracted to a point. The camera obscura reached the height of popularity in the 18th and 19th centuries, both as an amusement and as a drawing aid for artists. Vermeer and Sir Joshua Reynolds, along with many other artists, are known to have used them. During the 19th century, there were hundreds in existence, but with the invention of photography in 1839, camera obscura slowly disappeared. Today, there are approximately 50 public camera obscuras in the world, five of which are in the United States, including Long Island and San Francisco. The oldest photographic image is a view of the garden of Joseph Nisiphor Nieps. He produced this image using a camera obscura on a paper covered with silver nitrate. In 1837 to 1839, Louis-Jacques Mondé Daguerre created his first daguerreotype. In 1839, he announced his new process to the Academy of Sciences in Paris. The Giraud daguerreotype became the first commercially manufactured camera. It was designed by Louis-Jacques Mondé Daguerre, the inventor of the daguerreotype process, and manufactured by Giraud, a relative of Daguerre's wife. The 1839 invention of photography greatly impacted the world of painting. Photography was a perfect solution to art in the time of enlightenment. Scientific, reasonable without unnecessary flourishes. Now photographs rather than paintings would serve as historic records of a time period. Paintings were in direct competition with the camera. Why spend hours posing for a portrait when a photograph could be made in minutes? This photograph of a Parisian boulevard taken by Louis Daguerre in 1839 is the first photo of a human being. The man having his shoes shined stood still long enough to appear in the photo. This street would have been filled with horses, carts, and pedestrians, none of which stood still long enough to appear in the exposure. The first photographs required an exposure of between 3 to 15 minutes, depending on temperature. During a long exposure, such as those required in photography's infancy, a person who stood still long enough would register as clearly as a building. But a person who moved out of the camera range after only a portion of the exposure would instead appear as a see-through blur. These ghost images were the result of this long exposure process. Individuals were only still long enough to partially appear. Early portraits then appeared stiff, with the sitter looking stern and unsmiling. Photographers would admonish the person to not smile, as a smile was difficult to hold perfectly still for this long process, and props were used by the photographer to make certain of immobility of the sitter during photography. The process of photography quickly spread around the world. The daguerreotype process was introduced in the spring of 1839, and later that year a photograph was taken in New York City. This photograph is from a plate marked April 1840. Niagara Falls at that time was already a busy attraction with around 25,000 tourists a year visiting the falls. The photographer, H. L. Pattison, is believed to have taken the photograph and then walked to the falls and stood still long enough to appear in the photograph. Photographers began to use hunting terms when discussing this new medium. They went out to shoot a photo, and photos were called snapshots, a shooting term meaning a quick draw. Photography was used the way painting had been used, creating landscape, portraits, still lifes, pictorial images, and illustrating historical events. This daguerreotype is an early example of a news photo, created in order to serve as a reference for an artist creating engraving for a news journal. Two men had been boating on the Niagara River. They had been overwhelmed by the river's strong current, lost control of their boat, and crashed into a rock. 
the current quickly carried one man over Niagara Falls to his death. This daguerreotype shows the second man stranded on a log which had jammed between two rocks. He weathered the current for 18 hours before finally succumbing to the river. This image is an early example of a news photograph. Abraham Lincoln was the first president to recognize the power of the photograph for propaganda. Photographs of him were important to his election to the presidency. Person. This is Lincoln before he was president, uh, just about when he was starting to run for president. It's uh, Lincoln uh, when he's uh, really at the height of his uh, career. It's actually a, a copy of the original negative that was made in the late 1850s by Alexander Hessler. Uh, it was one of Lincoln's favorite portraits. It's uh, celebrated as one of the best portraits uh, ever made of Lincoln. One of the most important things about Lincoln that makes him interesting still is his face, the look of the man. The original still exists, but in a broken form. At, since it's a piece of glass, glass is uh, easily broken. It was sent through the mail and was broken in the mail, which still happens every day to a piece of glass. So not every piece of glass has Lincoln on it. And each photograph of him, there's, a, there's an estimated about 130, 140 different portraits of him. Each one is different significantly different. He looks different, he is different uh, in mood, uh, in visual aspect, uh, uh, in the whole history of his life it's different. Uh, the negative was the thing that was in the camera. He was in the room with Lincoln, the light that bounced off of him and passed through the lens hit that plate, so it has a sort of souvenir, artifactual, a sort of relic value. Each one gives you an insight. It's like seeing the man himself. Uh, this is a, a real interesting issue here, is that what is actually in this image? This copy is the closest thing to the original negative. Um, it also is broken, but broken in a different way so that we're able to see more information uh, that's present. It was a very high quality photography to begin with. It was very well done and we must do everything we can to keep that information that's present, to copy it, and to treat properly the original. It's literally a puzzle, and we have to solve that puzzle. And the, the, it's a puzzle on a puzzle on a puzzle on a puzzle. It's uh, many layers of puzzle, and uh, that's what we have experience here with, and interest in. We're really interested not only in solving the puzzle, and repairing as best we can the problem that has developed, but in respecting the object and making it accessible to others. Uh, the issue of repairing, uh, the concept that in conservation you don't want to do anything that you cannot undo. President Lincoln hired the photographer Matthew Brady to capture images of the Civil War. This photograph was taken by an army surgeon of a runaway slave named Gordon and was published in Harper's Weekly to be used as a recruitment poster to enlist African-American soldiers to the Union forces. Matthew Brady's photographers were sent in wagons which served as rolling dark rooms capturing battle scenes. By the 1850s, the Daguerre process had been replaced by the wet plate process resulting from discoveries by Frederick Scott Archer in 1851. Negatives were now produced on glass plates rather than metal. This allowed for shorter exposures, but one broken wagon wheel could send the photographer back to New York City for supplies. The devastation of the Civil War was illustrated by Brady's young war photographers, Alexander Gardner and Timothy O'Sullivan. In 1864, Civil War photographer Alexander Gardner photographed Ford's Theater, the funeral of Lincoln, and the imprisonment and execution of the conspirators. Ironically, before the war, he had also photographed this portrait of the assassin, John Wilkes Booth. After the war, these young photographers went with the U.S. Army geological expeditions to the American West. Joining the 1867 Clarence King Geological Survey of the 40th Parallel, Timothy O'Sullivan was used to take photographs of Native American Anasazi cliff dwellings, and one of the first photographers to use flash photography, a process which involved burning magnesium in an iron skillet to produce a flash of light. Uh, 
this is the conservation laboratory of the Eastman House. Uh, the George Eastman House was the first institution to formally establish a conservation laboratory uh, devoted solely to photography. You know, this is a replica of the Walcott camera, uh, which was the first uh, successful portrait camera, right? Uh, in 1975, when it was established, it brought the traditions of the industry and technology, which is largely uh, focused on the image. If you wanted to preserve the image, you would copy it, transfer it to a new carrier. And the traditions of fine art conservation that gives a lot of emphasis and value to the actual object. Yeah, you see in the back here, there is a mirror. See, the, the, it's, it's a concave mirror in the back. Well, that concave mirror will focus an image here, if I put this in here. And uh, so without a lens, using the primary optical device, which is the mirror, far older than the, the lens, they were able to make portraits in uh, as first as short as a minute, then 30 seconds, then down to six seconds in 1840, which made commercial portraiture possible with, with this camera. Well, conservation today isn't what you normally think of as restoration. You have something old that you try to make look new. Uh, conservation is largely uh, devoted today to keeping the, con the piece in the condition that it is in uh, first. We've had uh, experiences here, for instance, the famous uh, tintype of Billy the Kid. You know, the image of Billy the Kid and with, you know, standing with the rifle, looking buck-toothed and goofy. Uh, that was brought here uh, for documentation and conservation. Uh, it's a, an American icon, you know, we, we have certain images in our minds. Uh, this Billy the Kid images is one, is one of that. There's only one. It was brought here, we made documents of it in the condition that it was in, and uh, we preserved probably the best record of it. A Photograph of George Custer was brought into the lab early when I was a conservator, and it had been uh, the corner of it had been broken in an exhibition accident. And as I was uh, preparing to repair the photograph, I remember that I had seen this photograph in a book, and it was the first time that I realized there was a George Eastman house, because the credit under the photograph was in the collection of George Eastman house. And I had thought, wow, I would like to see the original of that photograph. Well, 30 years later, there it was in front of me, and I had forgotten my desire to go to the George Eastman house to see this photograph. But not only was I, I seeing it, but I was intimately involved in touching it and touching it with intent to do good to it. It was a deeply moving experience for me to understand that there is a, a sort of chain and continuity of experiences that uh, you're unaware of. So many people say photography is magical, but they don't tell you what they mean by that. Magic what? You make a bunny appear out of a hat? Is that what you mean? Well, it's, yeah, there's some trick to it. I've heard photography described as the heartbreaking trick. It's mysterious, miraculous, but it's science. It's the uh, stopping of time. It's a time technology. Uh, what you were talking about, the ability to stop time for a moment by your will which makes you significant. And the traditional definition of magic that I have always used is to control nature according to the will of man. The 1877 invention of celluloid film allowed inventor George Eastman to make a dramatic change in the way the world took pictures. Celluloid film was pliable and able to be rolled. George Eastman introduced a new type of camera, often called a spy camera, which was small and compact. He created the Eastman Kodak Company. Cameras could be purchased with film rolled inside. The photographer would then shoot the photographs, mail the camera back to the company headquarters in Rochester, New York, where the film would be processed, new film would be placed into the camera, and the entire thing would be shipped back to the photographer. This meant that everyday, ordinary people could take photographs. The Eastman Kodak Company advertised this, saying that even children could take photographs.
color was the next barrier in photography. In a process called autochrome, photographs were hand-colored. Then, in 1936, Kodachrome was invented. Kodachrome was the standard color film until digital photography made the film obsolete. The camera captures images on a special plastic film, which has been coated with light-sensitive silver halide, to make it sensitive to light. Processing the film in various chemicals, known as developing the film, produces either negatives or transparencies. This is the diaphragm. On more sophisticated cameras, the diaphragm can be adjusted to create a larger or smaller opening for the light to enter. We're all familiar with the lens. The lens consists of a number of layers of glass specially constructed to focus the light which enters the camera onto the film. The viewfinder enables the photographer to see which image the camera will capture. When the release button is pressed, the shutter opens for a fraction of a second. In some cameras, it can be as little as one two-thousandth of a second. In most cameras, it is between one-thirtieth to one-sixtieth of a second. This enables the light to enter the camera and the image to be projected upside down onto the film at the rear of the camera. In more sophisticated cameras, the lens can be moved closer or further away from the film. Changing the distance between the lens and the film changes the focus of the camera. A lens which can be moved in this way is called a zoom lens. In many modern cameras, the distance between the camera and the object to be photographed is measured by an infrared or ultrasonic wave emitted by the camera. The lens is then focused automatically. Well, this is the uh, silicon imaging SI2K uh, mini camera. The light passes through the lens and is transmitted into the uh, image sensor. In this camera is a single chip CMOS sensor CMOS, which is a uh, complementary metal oxide semiconductor, like a CCD as a pickup device, where each pixel has a color filter, which is either red, green, or blue. Photonic data is converted into a digital form and then transmitted in a uncompressed format. And that digital data is then transmitted to the computer processing system, where each of those pixels is then developed to create an RGB or full color uh, value on a per pixel basis in order to create your digital photo or video stream. Digital photography began in 1990 and the first cameras were on the market by 1998 and cost around $6,000. But today digital photography is available to almost everyone through their cellular phones. And in 2005, cellular phone cameras were used to capture the terrorist attack on the London subways.